following recording is done by Redemption Hill Church. We are delighted that you are listening in and pray that God would use this message to bless you and equip you to glorify His name. However, we also want to encourage you that this resource is in no way meant to replace your need for a local church or the biblical care and guidance you receive from your pastor and church elders. May God bless you as you listen to this sermon. Brothers and sisters, it is such a joy to be able to preach before all of you week after week. Um, I keep pausing and thinking how how God of all, how God could choose me of all people um, for this great and grand privilege to preach the word of God. My desire every week brothers and sisters, is that the truth of God's word would so capture your hearts in such a way that you will never be the same. Week on week, that we would grow from, from glory to glory. Not from year on year, not from camps to camps, not from retreats to retreats, but from week upon week. When we hear the word of God, when we worship together, my, my desire is to see that we all as God's people would go past the veil of the imagination to beholding God for who He is. That we would not turn to Jesus' stickers and Jesus' movies and Jesus' posters to have an image of Him, but that the Word of God would frame an image of who He truly is. As preachers like Paul Washer keep reminding us, that there is a place that we can be where God is more real than the people around us. Oh, how I wish, oh, how I pray that that's what happens to us as a church week on week, that you will see God, that you will behold God and never be the same again. It is a joy and a privilege to do this. And I want you to know that the intention of Redemption Hill Church every Sunday morning or every sermon and every time we gather and the word of God preached is this, that we would see God. We would not be the same. So pray with me, brothers and sisters, that the Lord would do that today again in our midst. Today we find ourselves upon a passage that brings us back to the topic of fasting. And some of you might want to ask, but did we not cover this topic a few weeks back? Yes, we did. When Matthew recounted Jesus' teaching on fasting in Matthew 6, 16 to 18. Matthew 6, 16 to 18. Let me read it for you. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. We looked at fasting in detail when we came upon this verse. So why are we back here? And my way of answering such a question is to first rephrase it into a better question. The question is not why I am bringing you back to the topic of fasting, but why is Matthew bringing us back to the topic of fasting? And the answer, because this text is about a whole lot more than fasting. You see, here the subject of the passage that we are about to look into is not merely about what, of, what fasting is. Here the subject of fasting is used to outline for us a much greater reality that I so desire for each one of us to understand and believe. Brothers and sisters, the instruction of the Lord for us today is a beautiful and powerful anchor to Christian spirituality. Let me repeat that. The instruction of the Lord that He has for us today 
is a beautiful and powerful anchor to true Christian spirituality. Who among us in this room does not want to be spiritual? Do we not all desire to be godly and that our spirituality be overflowing? And for those of you in this room who so desire to be spiritual in that manner, this sermon is for you. This instruction that the Lord gives us today is for you. Well, let me back up a bit and explain before we move into Christian spirituality. You see, in the last two weeks, we have been addressing the topic of the proper use of doctrines. The proper use of Christian doctrines. The word doctrine oftentimes sends chills down many Christians' spines. It, it sends fear down their minds because the moment they hear the word doctrine, what they understand is the word theory. And we all have been to schools and colleges to know the difference between theory and practical. And whenever people hear the word doctrine, what they realize or what they begin to understand or how they picture it, is that it is theory. These are people who, are old, who only care about the theoretical aspects of it. They don't care about the practical side of things. But I want to remind you again and again, church, that the word doctrine simply means teaching. When we say biblical doctrine, what we mean is biblical teaching. And what the Bible teaches is not just for theory. So when you see people who use the word doctrine and only live a theoretical life and have no practical overflow, that's not the problem with the word doctrine. That's the problem with the people who use the word doctrine. And on account of those people, when we throw out the use of this word doctrine, we pretty much throw the baby out with the bathwater. And so in the last two weeks, we have been addressing the topic of the proper use of doctrine. First, in the first week, in the miracle of the paralytic, what did we see there? We saw how the heavy-headed Pharisees, who prided in their devotion to the word of God, could not recognize the word of God incarnate who stood before them. Just think about it. There is this paralytic man whom they bring for Jesus to heal and the Pharisees who spent all their lives studying the word of God could not recognize the word of God who stood before them, Jesus Christ. It was one of those cases where you could look at the doctrinally minded man and say, you wouldn't know doctrine if it put on hands and legs and stood before you in flesh. Because that's what happened. We have people who claim to be doctrinal, who claim to be biblical, who, cl who claim to be people of the word of God, committed to the holy scriptures. And it is tantamount to telling these Pharisees, you wouldn't know true scripture if it put on hands and legs and stood before you. And it did. The word became flesh and lived among us and stood before them and they could not recognize him. The reason they could not recognize him was because they never truly recognized the word of God or the holy scriptures in the first place. You see, brothers and sisters, it is not doctrine that prevented them from seeing Jesus. It is the wrong use of doctrine that prevented them from seeing Jesus. Because throughout what Jesus tells them is not, can you not feel it is me? Can you not feel it in your hearts that it is me? That is not what Jesus says. Jesus says, have you not read? And he constantly keeps taking them back to scripture. Because the men of the holy scriptures 
were supposed to be the men who would know Jesus when he appeared before them, but they did not. We saw how this is a condition of many Christians who today cleave to doctrinal convictions who could never recognize the Savior if they saw him stand before them. So that was the first week. And in the second week, in the call of the Apostle Matthew into the ministry and the Lord's kindness in sharing a meal with sinners and tax collectors, we see the Pharisees with hardened hearts who could never rise in pursuit of God's heart for the sinner. What do you do? Why are you eating with sinners and tax collectors? Why does your master do this is what they asked. Their hearts could not rise in pursuit of God's heart for the sinner. So in the first instance, in the first week, we see the failure of the mind. And in the second instance, we see the failure of the heart. And Christians today, Christians today can be categorized into two in general those who pursue to feed their minds which we have come to call as people who are doctrinally minded and those who pursue to feed their hearts feelings the people we call the spiritually minded and so we begin to look at people and we begin to look at Christianity on two fronts the Bible doctrine driven, driven man and the Holy Spirit driven man. Brothers and sisters, there is no doctrines or there is no teachings and there is no beliefs today that I hate more than this. Because how do you dare separate the word of God from the spirit of God? They are not two. They are not separate. They are one. For the word of God is the word inspired by the spirit of God. Therefore, when a man disregards the work of the Holy Spirit and pursues doctrine only as an intellectual pursuit and the man who puts aside doctrine to pursue God only on the basis of his feelings, both sin. And the solution of avoiding one is not to attach yourself onto the other. And what you need to remember today, brothers and sisters, that Christians in increasing amount want to go in either of the two directions. Because of experiences, because of baggage, because of what they have seen. But beloved, baggage and experiences and your life's history does not determine Christian truth. The word of God does. And in their corresponding extremes, in these two positions, you have the legalist who cares only for the mind and you have the whitewashed liberal who cares only for the feelings of the heart. And so you begin to see people talk in that way. You know, you, you are so heavy-headed, you need to let your heart out once in a way. Or you hear people say that, you know, you're just driven by your heart. You need to be coming back to the word of God. Both those statements are good statements. But they oftentimes don't result in wise responses. You see, for the same odd reason that has me beating my head against the wall, people leaning towards either end of this spectrum tend to look on to the other side and only see the other extreme. It's as though people who are leaning towards a more liberal thinking tend to look the other way and the only people they are able to see are the extremes on the other side. And people on the other side of it tend to look this way and are only able to see the other extreme. <coughs> I'll, I'll give you an example. When Redemption Hill Church was planted, we decided 
that we were going to go to scripture and base all our doctrinal convictions out of scripture as best as we could understand them, as best as we could prioritize them. So we came up with our doctrinal statement. And in fact, in our doctrinal statement initially, we did not include a whole lot of things that we didn't have an idea about. We didn't simply want to call ourselves this and that because others call themselves this and that. If we did not know what the Word of God taught, taught about a particular subject, we were open about it. But the Word of God has taught us in the course of five years and continues to teach us things that we keep adding on. And so, one of the things we found out when we planted the church is that we believed that the Word of God is the only authority by which we can know what the Christian needs to do and how the Christian needs to live. It is the only truth. It is the only tangible piece of truth by which we can know how Christians ought to live. And when we did that, our charismatic brothers on the other side looked at us and said, okay, these guys are legalists. These guys are going down the path of just being legalists. And when we as a church believed that God continues to bless the church with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, some of us who are gifted, and so we began to teach on the gifts of the Holy Spirit and why it's important, and suddenly our conservative brothers look at us and think that we are charismatics of the other extreme. And strange enough, we found ourselves smack dab right in the middle with people not wanting to associate with us on either side. And the problem is simply that either side can only see the other extreme. Therefore, the liberal leaning, heart feeling oriented believer sees the only alternative as the hard nosed legalist whose only care in the world is if the book of Leviticus should be reintroduced in the New Testament. That's all they see. That's what these guys want. They just want to take the Levitical laws and just impose it on the New Testament. That's their pursuit. Whereas the conservative-leaning, doctrine-oriented believer sees the only alternative as that watered-down liberal who can't remember if Leviticus is a book in the Bible or the name of a character in the Lord of the Rings. And that's what they see when they look at each other. And you need to understand, brothers and sisters, that constantly believers are drawn into each of these sides instead of going to scripture. The point is this, that both sides get doctrine wrong. One by pursuing it only academically and the other by sidestepping it entirely and not pursuing it at all. Both of them get them wrong. And more and more I see believers being pulled in either direction, not realizing the fact that either end of this spectrum gets biblical teaching wrong. They get Christianity wrong. They get spirituality wrong. In fact, Jesus responds in the first instance, which we saw in the first week, where the Pharisees condemn Jesus' authority, is that they think evil. That's what Jesus told them. You are thinking evil. Think about that. We know that true knowledge of God's word does not produce evil thinking. It produces righteous thinking. And Jesus says you are thinking evil in your hearts. And that is because they are holding doctrines wrongly. And in the second instance, in the second week, where the Pharisees condemn Jesus' close interaction and mercy to sinners, Jesus' response to them is not to abandon their doctrines and see what was happening, but that they go and learn their doctrines properly. Therefore, my point is this. And I want you to know this. I want you to write it down if you must. The bottom line is this. The problem of the legalistic mind, the mind that is academically driven to doctrine only, 
the legalistic mind and the problem of and get ready to learn a new word the antinomian mind which is the liberal extreme mind the mind that cares nothing about the laws of God the doctrines of God or any of that but just cares about grace and mercy and feeling and love so the problem of the legalistic mind and the problem of the antinomian mind is the same. And that problem is not doctrine, it is the lack of proper doctrine. They both get doctrine wrong. And the need for proper doctrine is the message of today's sermon. Brothers and sisters, true Christian spirituality can never be found without true Christian doctrine. Without true Christian teaching, without true Christian doctrine, true Christian spirituality can never be found. Because you have no truth to anchor your experience on. I know of brothers and sisters who have gone to, to their friends who are not Christians, who are from a Hindu background or otherwise, and they tell them, you know why I believe in Jesus? Because you know what? I prayed this and the Lord answered, and so I know and I believe in Him. And they are met with a response from the others of the other faith who respond by saying, you know what, amen to you, but you know what, I prayed and God did this. And so I believe in God as well. You don't evangelize people and think they will believe just because you have experiences to quote. They believe because the gospel is preached. They believe because the message of the salvation that we have in the work of the Son of God is preached. For Paul himself writes in scripture, how are people to believe if they have not heard? And how are they to hear if, they, if no one preaches? And how are people to preach if they are not sent? God has founded the church upon the word of God preached. And so, brothers and sisters, true Christian spirituality can never be found without true Christian teaching or true Christian doctrine, period. Matthew 9, 14 to 17. Matthew 9, 14 to 17. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for, that, for the patch tears away from the garment and a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is, the skin bursts and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins and so both are preserved. What a wonderful passage. And it is a passage so much more than just about fasting. Before we move into the exegesis of this text, or the study of this text, there's a crucial reality that you must keep in mind. A crucial reality that all of you must keep in mind as we study this passage. And that is this. There is a certain pattern to the way God has worked, to the way God has worked amongst us in scripture. If you take the story of Noah in Genesis 6, when God called Noah and told him that he was going to destroy the whole world with a flood, he told Noah that he wanted him to build an ark. 
you know if you if you were in the planning committee of the end of the world disaster of the floods coming and you had to preserve all of uh, god's creation how many of you would come up with an idea of let's build an ark put stuff on a boat right it it seems to be almost one of those fairy tales or or stories that children would love to hear but that's precisely what god did he asked him to build an ark and guess what the ark had to be big enough to hold noah's family and two of every kind of animal and to store up all kinds of food now if i were noah at that point i would say lord i need about 300 men maybe 3000 men so that we can build this ark that needs to accommodate everything that you want us to accommodate No, God chose one man and his family. And God gave him the wood he has to use, the precise instructions of how he needs to build it and how big it needs to be. So many times in the scripture we see that God begins to say this is what I want, this is what's going to happen and this is how I'm going to save you. This is how I'm going to use you. When Samuel saw the strong and handsome sons of Jesse to anoint for the new king god set apart the shepherd boy outside and god told samuel you look at outward appearances but i look at the heart and i have prepared for myself a man after my own heart how many of us would anoint a king the way samuel did and when israel fought the philistines the armor of saul and the armor of israel was not what david used to defeat the great giant it was stones and a sling you have to understand how ridiculous this is you've got a young lad who walks into a battlefield upon whom the armors of saul could not fit because he was so small and he walks upon a battlefield to beat a giant that none of the soldiers of israel could face even together and he walks upon that battlefield with a sling you have to understand how ridiculous this sounds but that's the only way god was going to do it we see in the story of azza in second samuel 6 Azza could not survive when he stretched out his hand to hold the ark of the covenant from falling when the carriage stumbled. He could not survive it. He was destroyed. You have no right to touch it. Or you you, you listen to the story of Gideon in Judges 7 when he went out for the battle, he went out to win the battle and he had 32,000 men with him. God said that's too much. Who goes into war saying that the soldiers are too much? and god reduced it down by removing 22000 people and again removing and finally he went with 300 men okay i want you to see how ridiculous this is 32300 jesus did not choose the pharisees or the scribes or the cream of the crop for his apostle he chose a tax collector named matthew There's a certain pattern you're seeing here, right? Most of us know these things and we quickly identify with these stories that God uses the fools to shame the wise, the weak to overtake the strong, the last to be the first. And we love this truth, we preach this truth and we have heard it over and over again. How God takes the fool to shame the wise. the weak to overtake the strong and the last to be the first how mighty is our god that he uses simple weak men for mighty deeds but brothers and sisters there is one more equally important truth that we need to identify here and that is what i want you to keep in mind a constant pattern you see throughout scripture an equally important truth that you must engrave into your hearts and that is this that god reserves for him alone to choose the ends and the means 
God reserves for himself alone the right to choose the ends and the means. If God says that's going to happen, he chooses how it's going to happen. You and I don't. And therefore, as Christians, we come upon the word of God, not just to know what God is going to do, but also to know how God is doing it. Because God determines how it must be done. And I want you to keep this in mind as we study this passage. Verse 14 of Matthew 9. Let's start with the first verse. Verse 14. Then the disciples of John came to him saying, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? You see, in all of Matthew's narration so far, the only people to question Jesus' authority or, or, or question Jesus' manner or way of working were the Pharisees and the unbelieving. But now you can add to the mix the disciples of John. John the front runner. Disciples whose very ministry is to make the path clear for Jesus. That's their job as disciples of John is to make the way clear for the Messiah and even they come to Jesus confused about the way Jesus worked. Even they could not understand some of the ways Jesus did things. And so they came and asked him, why do we and the Pharisees fast but your disciples do not fast? You see, brothers and sisters, when we studied fasting weeks back, when we covered Matthew 6, we learned a few things. Fasting is an expression. What is fasting? It is an expression wherein we are brought so severely to the point of longing, of needing, of wanting God to work in our lives. That something as basic and fundamental as food is overlooked. What is fasting? It's not merely an act. It is not merely an act to please God. Fasting in scripture is an expression. It is an emotion overflowing where you have such a longing, such a need, such a want for God to work for something. That you put aside even food. I have no time for food. I just need to pray and I need to plead. Oh Lord, work. When we fast, we are in such a need for God that we don't even think about eating. And, and, and when you apply that kind of a definition for fasting, you begin to see that fasting really has a lot more to do than just skipping food. Because fasting is the act of putting aside for the sake of something more important. That you put aside everything to pray. Which is why fasting is not dieting. Which is why fasting is not, uh, you know, not eating food and sitting and watching Netflix. That's not fasting. Fasting is not when you wake up in the morning too late not to have breakfast and then call it fasting. That's not fasting. Fasting is to be so burdened about praying and asking God to work that you can't think about eating and Netflix or any of these other things. In 2 Samuel 12, 16, David fasted and prayed when Bathsheba's first child was sick. David even fasted for his enemies according to Psalm 35, 13. People fasted in the face of overwhelming danger that God might favor and rescue them as we see in 2 Chronicles 23, Esther 4, 16. It's throughout the Bible. Ezra declares a fast when the exiles were returning from Babylon to Jerusalem where he says that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for us, our little ones and all our possessions. Ezra 8, 21. That, that to do this was an act of humility. Lord, I cannot move on. I cannot do anything unless you work. So I'm putting aside even food and coming to you like a desperate beggar because there is no strength within me. It is only within you. David fasted as he prayed for God's forgiveness for the sins of the people. So did Ezra. When Jonah prophesied against Nineveh, they were convicted 
and called for a great fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them and God relented. Daniel fasted and prayed that he might give his full attention to God in order that he might receive God's revelation when he wanted to know the, the, the revelation and, and, and the interpretation of the dreams that he was called to do. So you see, brothers and sisters, that's what fasting is. And the Bible does not command fasting, it commends it. And it commends it very much. And our passage today is one of the greatest commendation that Jesus gives for Christian fasting. We will see that as we move on. Therefore, the question for Christians is not if we fast, but when we fast. So that's a recap for you on what we looked at fasting. And now let's come back to our passage. For all these reasons, the disciples of John were puzzled why Jesus' disciples were not fasting. Don't they have a longing for God to work? Why are they not fasting? Did they not want God to work as much as the others did in order to free them from their Roman overlords? The Jewish people fasted for many things and one of the most important things they fasted was for God to redeem them from the chains of the Romans. Has it not been over 400 years since they had seen a prophet and now finally God brings John the Baptist? If anything, this is the time to fast for God is doing a mighty work in their midst. They're confused. Were you not fasting? Why are they not fasting? Verse 15, and Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them? The first thing you recognize in that response of Jesus is that he correlates fasting to mourning. Brothers and sisters, we will not fast in the kingdom of heaven. We will feast in the kingdom of heaven. There is a mourning to fasting because you're longing for God to work. And Jesus said to them, can the wedding guests mourn? Can they fast as long as the bridegroom is with them? In the Old Testament, we see that Yahweh, God Almighty, was referred to as the bridegroom. Isaiah 62, 5. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. The people listening to Jesus saying this, they know who the bridegroom is. Hosea 2, 19-20 And I will betroth you to me forever and I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in steadfast love and in mercy. I will betroth you to me in faithfulness and you shall know the Lord. Therefore, every fast in the Old Testament was a mourning and a longing for God's favor upon their lives. And suddenly the bridegroom stood before them. And not even the disciples of John, the way makers for the Messiah, could recognize him. Listen to the subtle yet unmistakable claim that Jesus makes here. I am the bridegroom. So next time you have your friends who are Muslims who tell you that Jesus never claimed to be God, there you go. He is the bridegroom. And so in the Old Testament, throughout, even in that time, the Jewish people fasted as a mourning and a longing for God, but their context of fasting was in the context of a nation under God, the nation of Israel. So the kinds of things that they fasted and prayed for were informed by a particular worldview that they had that God's intentions and promises were for the people of Israel. And so everything they knew about what fasting was, was instructed from that worldview that they had. Brothers and sisters, do you see doctrine slowly begin to play a part 
in the way they practiced the spiritual act of fasting. And so that was their context. That, is what, that was the context of the people in the Old Testament. And then Jesus follows up in the remaining part of this verse with a word of prophecy. The days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them and then they will fast. Jesus prophesies about his departure when he ascends to the Father in heaven after being raised from the dead. But when that happens, when the bridegroom is taken away, this is what Jesus says, then they will fast. This is as close to a command, if you can call it that, for fasting that one can get from the Bible. There was going to be a time, according to Jesus, when he was saying this, when men would fast in mourning and longing again. You've been fasting all these years in mourning and longing for God. My disciples do not because I'm here. Your mourning and longing for, for the God of your life to work upon your life. I am here right before you. Why do you mourn? Why do you fast? Just ask and it will be given to you. And therefore my disciples do not fast. But when the bridegroom is taken away, they will mourn and long again. They will fast again. Except this time the context would be very different. For earlier they fasted for the salvation of the Jews from foreign rule and the establishment of the kingdom of Israel as God's people. That was the basis of fasting in the Old Testament of the Jewish people then. But now we fast for the salvation, not just of Israel, but of the whole world, of people from every tongue, tribe and nation, and the establishment, not of the kingdom of Israel, but of the kingdom of God. A kingdom not of this world. Earlier they fasted in the hope that the Messiah would come, but now we fast in the hope that the Messiah has come. And will come again when he establishes his kingdom. Jesus came and established his authority over all things. Brothers and sisters, we fast in hope that he will come again for the final redemption of all things. But the fasting of the New Testament, therefore, is no longer the fasting of the Old Testament. Because the biblical teaching that informed the fasting of the Old Testament is now not possible. Is now not possible. Why? Because God has done something new. God has done something more. And that is Jesus' intention for us today. And Jesus goes on to explain that in the next two verses. Verses 16 to 17. No one puts a piece of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch tears away from the garment. And a worse tear is made. Neither is new wine put into old wineskins. If it is the skin bursts and the wine is spilled and the skins are destroyed. But new wine is put into fresh wineskins. So both are preserved. This passage used to confuse me growing up a whole lot. Maybe confuses a lot of you here. This is what Jesus is trying to say. Jesus explains the way the new things of the New Testament are to be handled. And he uses two simple and clear examples to do that. If we patch a tear in an old dress with a, with a piece of cloth that is new, what do you think would happen? The old dress has probably shrunk from repeated washing. Right? So you buy a new dress and you all experience that today, right? We put it for wash, we buy a bigger size knowing that it's going to at some level shrink. And so the old piece of cloth has probably shrunk and if you stitch in a new piece of cloth into that tear and you put it for wash, what's going to happen? 
Well, the old piece of cloth is not going to shrink anymore. The new piece is going to shrink and it's going to tear right off and the tear is going to be worse. And what's the result? The result is that both the dress and the piece of cloth are now unusable. He uses another example. Old wineskins are not capable of holding new wine because the old wineskins that are supposed to hold the wine are old. And so they stand the risk of bursting and spilling over the wine, destroying both the wine and the wineskin. Only fresh wineskins can pr preserve both the wine and the wineskin. And the picture is simple and clear. God was doing a new thing in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus. And the Old Testament would not be able to hold the new things. And that's what was happening when the disciples of John were approaching Jesus with old wineskins. With old wineskins. Referring to the Old Testament and referring to all the doctrines they learnt of the Old Testament because the Old Testament is not able to hold the new wine. You need new wineskins. It was not going to do the people any good if they held only to the doctrinal understanding of the Old Testament and tried to accommodate all of Jesus' things that he did into that. And that's precisely why they were keeping on getting it wrong. They could not recognize that God was doing a new thing. They needed to update their doctrines with new wineskins. That Jesus was offering them. For Jesus was not just coming and offering them new experiences. He was doing new teaching. He was preaching. And he was giving his word, his message. And he was completing the story that he began to write in the book of Genesis. Which when ended in the book of Malachi, Jesus was going to institute the gospel. The New Testament. For in preaching and teaching, Jesus was offering them new wineskins, capable of holding the new wine of his grace and mercy in healing, forgiving, restoring and redeeming the people. So what the people had to do was not just look at what Jesus was doing and try to use the Old Testament to accommodate it. What they needed to do was also to hear what he was teaching. For he was adding on to scripture new things. In other words, as commendable as John's disciples' desire to fast may be, it was not going to do them any good if they did not have the new wineskins to hold the new fast once Jesus ascended. Which is why in the New Testament you have Paul going up to disciples at Ephesus who tell them that they have been baptized in the baptism of John, but they have not known the Holy Spirit. Or when, Apollo, or when, when Apollos was going around and uh, uh, Aquila and Priscilla called him aside and said, no, let, me, let us show you the whole counsel of the word of God. And they taught him the new things along with the old and gave him the whole counsel of the word and Apollos went back flaming with truth, unstoppable. And so it was not going to do them any good. The context of spirituality, or rather, the vessels of true spirituality, or rather the cradle of spirituality, is doctrine. If you do not have a vessel to hold your experiences, it's worthless. And the point, brothers and sisters, is this. Whether you like the word doctrine or not, whether you like theory or not, you are all theoretical. Because whether it is by reading the word of God or listening to preaching or watching the Jesus movie or your experiences, everything is informing you and causing you to build a certain belief. 
a certain understanding and you all have vessels and cradles to hold your experiences. But the God-given cradle to hold your spirituality is doctrine. When Jesus refers, what Jesus refers, sorry, to as wineskins is biblical teaching. It is doctrine. It is the vessel of understanding that carries, that savors the truth of God. Our experiences may teach us many things, but unless we have a cradle that is biblical, we can never understand our experiences or enjoy true spirituality. I use the word cradle very carefully because what we put into a cradle is what we value the most. You don't take a baby and throw them on the floor. You don't take a baby and hang them on the wall. You take a baby and put them in a cradle. Such precious, such beauty is in the true and new vine of Jesus Christ. And the God-given cradle by which we are able to justify, understand and enjoy the experiences of God is doctrine. Therefore, the cradle of Jewish spirituality were the doctrines of the Old Testament. But the cradle of Christian spirituality are the doctrines of the New Testament, which according to Jesus does not abolish the Old Testament, but fulfills it. For I have not come to abolish the law and the prophets, but I have come to fulfill them, and not a dot, an iota of the word of God shall pass away, though heaven and earth may pass away, until all is accomplished. That Jesus did not come to do away with the Old Testament. He came to complete it. And therefore, true Christian spirituality is both the Old Testament and the New put together in 66 books we call the Bible. For the New Testament better informs and completes the mystery given to us and we have now the whole counsel of God's word from Genesis to Revelation, Christian doctrine. Brothers and sisters, without it, you cannot know God. And so that is the emphasis of Jesus' teaching in this passage. You see, fasting, therefore, has become a subject to something much more important that God is trying to say. That true Christian spirituality and spiritual life cannot be lived unless you have the cradle of doctrine. Do not fear that word, brothers and sisters, for men tend to destroy it in the display of their lives. But stop looking to men and start looking to Jesus and his word. So let me bring this to a conclusion. As I've warned you of these two extremes people are drawn to. We have the legalist and the antinomian. The legalist who only thinks about doctrines academically who do not live according to these doctrines. Last week I told you how doctrines are the means by which you know God. Today I put it in another way where I said they are the cradles by which you can truly experience and enjoy true Christian spirituality. And the legalist does not know that. For the legalist only cares to accumulate teaching and puff up their minds in knowledge. And on the other hand, you have what is known as the antinomian who does not care for the laws of God, who does not care for the rules of the Bible, who, who does not care for any of these things, who only want the experience, who only cares about experience. And both of them get it wrong and they are both extremes. You need the word of God and you need to experience God. And you cannot separate what people tend to call Doctrine driven and spirit driven, there is no such thing. It is a lie of cultural Christianity today. It is a lie if you have been taught that. The spirit of God is not separate from the word of God. They are one. And so the folly 
of the legalist and the folly of the antinomian, like I said, is the same. They get doctrine wrong. We'll start with the legalist in my conclusion. The folly of the legalist is the folly of the Pharisee. He pursues God's word in a self-obsessed tangent and forgets the fact that the wineskins are not the drink. They are vessels that hold the true vine. That doctrines are not the end, but the means by which you experience what is divine. Brothers and sisters, they get that wrong. For the only thing they care about is if rules are there and rules are kept. And they always fail to keep their own rules. And what they forget is that wineskins are not the true drink. Young men and women, if you desire to go to seminary, any one of you desires to go to a seminary at any point in your life to learn, why do you want to do it? Because so many young people want to do seminary today after listening to preachers like Paul Washer and John Piper and reading books by Charles Spurgeon and John Calvin and they want to go to seminary so that they can choke on wineskins. For they have never tasted a drop of the wine. And that's what the legalist gets wrong. You see... Beloved, one of the greatest folly of the legalist is that he forgets that truth is not an abstract. Truth is not a bunch of definitions. Truth is not a series of prognosis. Truth is a person and his name is Jesus Christ. And when they learn truth as a historical fact and an academic fact, they miss the person of Jesus Christ and they know nothing. That's what the legalist gets wrong. It's dangerous. It's folly. It's foolishness. It's frivolous. The wineskins, the doctrine, is the cradle of true Christian spirituality. Do you know what that means, brothers and sisters? If we believe in a doctrine like the assurance of salvation, that those who are truly born again can never lose their salvation, if you believe in this biblical teaching, then that teaching cradles our experience of a God who never fails us. A God from whose hands we can never be snatched. So that truth and that doctrine cradles our experience of a God who never fails us. Believing in a doctrine like the sovereignty of God is a biblical teaching that cradles our experience of the God who causes all things to work together for our good. For when we come upon tragedies in life, when we come upon sufferings in life, when we come upon the call of God upon us to build an ark and we don't have men, when we have to go out for war with 32,000 and God says take only 300 with you, what happens is that the cradle of knowledge that God is sovereign allows you to experience that in fullness. Believing in a doctrine like the doctrine of the Trinity is a biblical teaching that cradles for you the experience that God who in three persons pours us the love of the Father, the grace of the Son and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Doctrines are precious for they cradle for us the experience of what is true spirituality. Yes, brothers and sisters, it is true that doctrine in and of itself does not save, but it is the only conduit by which one is ultimately saved. For without the doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ, none can be saved. That is why people often say about legalistic communities that they are dry. 
they go into legalistic communities and come out and say, you know, it's very dry there. How will it not be dry when they have accumulated for themselves wine skins with no wine to drink? Of course, it's dry. And that's the folly of the legalist. What is the folly of the antinomian? Brothers and sisters, the folly of the antinomian is the folly of Satan. For he rejects God's word in a self-obsessed tangent and forgets the fact that without wineskins he has no way to hold the wine. A lot of Christians with a liberal leaning like to use the word freedom as a way to reduce down the anchoring themselves to biblical teaching. They love the word new. They are always coming up with new teachings and new methods of experiencing God. So what happens to the, to the antinomian, the liberal, the extreme liberal is this. When they cast aside the word of God and experience new wine, they need something to hold it. They need some cradle to hold it. And what is that cradle that holds it? Well, it is the cradle that they have for themselves from experiences, from the world, from politics, from finances. It is the cradle that they develop from watching Jesus movies and listening to debates. And you know what happens? It is like people coming to drink the new wine that God offers and they go and make vessels for them out of leaves and broken shards of glass that they can barely hold together into which the wine is poured and it seeps through all the crevices and it's pills out completely that they end up with just broken shards and no vine. You see, when they come up with new teachings to accommodate their experience, they come up with new methods of experiencing God, where they stand to worship in a room and they throw gold dust into the air in saying God is in our place and they try to elevate it with lights and, and don't get me wrong brothers and sisters I like stage and lights but they do this why because they want to add to it the feeling of the presence of God in their midst they'll dim the lights what are they doing they're trying to create a cradle that can hold the vine of God's truth but they forget one vital point the point that I mentioned in the beginning of this sermon no man has the right to choose the means by which God works in us no man has the right to choose the means to accomplish God's ends it is reserved for God and God alone. And God has chosen that the experience of true spirituality for you and me are cradled upon biblical teaching, the Holy Scripture, the Word of God. The Word of God is living and active sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit of bone and of marrow, discerning the intentions and the thoughts of the human heart. For a genuine believer who picks up the Bible will never be purely academic. He will be powerful, endowed in the presence and the authority of Christ. Do not leave the word of God for experiences and do not leave experiences for the academic learning of the word of God come to doctrine and see and behold your God every Christian experience every spiritual encounter every exercise of the Holy Spirit of the gifts of the Holy Spirit every wisdom and every counsel and every word preached has one and only one cradle capable of realizing them the true and wonderful doctrines of the word of God of 
Holy Scripture. When you tip on either side, it is not the folly of the Word of God or the doctrines of the Word of God. It is yours. And it is your sin and your sin alone. May the Lord equip each and every one of you to behold the truth of God's word and see the Lord of our lives. Let us pray. Heavenly gracious Father, we come before you in Jesus' name. We thank you for this time that you have given us in your word. We pray that you will so anchor your people this day, the truth of your word, that we might believe and be transformed. Your word does not stand in seclusion to your spirit. For your spirit works mightily in our midst through the gifts and through the power and in power and in authority. You work mighty things in our midst. But not in seclusion to your word. Your word and your spirit are one. Make us a people who are not driven by the worldly standards of the legalist and the antinomian. Make us people who are driven by your word and your word alone. In Jesus' name we pray.